You're here today. Can you believe this? Two days of no rain. Woohoo! It's good to see you here today, and I'm glad. I hope you had a good weekend this weekend, and thank you, Pastor Hunter, for walking us through those announcements. And if you're a guest with us, we're glad that you're here today. Uh, we're in an ongoing sermon series called Dealing with Difficult Negative People. All of us at times have to deal with people like that. And when we do, sometimes we're frustrated. We don't know how to respond, what should be the right reaction. So this series is kind of geared to help us all learn how to deal with that. Now, you can all go ahead. If you brought your Bibles, turn to Matthew 16. We will eventually get there uh, in this sermon. Or you can go ahead and pull out your sermon notes if you prefer your sermon outline. And so what I want us to do is we've already looked at how to deal with critical people. Last week, we looked at how to deal with needy people. Today, we're going to look at how do we deal with controlling and manipulating people, okay? Uh, to kind of jumpstart us, I've read a, I heard a story about Simon Peter. He was standing up in heaven welcoming new people into the, to heaven as they had died. And, and uh, one guy got there and he noticed there was two doors into the entrance of heaven, over one door had this sign that had, uh, for all the men who were controlled by their wives, stand here. And that line was as far as you could see for infinity. Men lined up everywhere. And then there was other door that had a sign over it that said, for men who were never controlled by their wives. And there was just one guy standing there. And Peter was kind of curious. Why is this this long line of all these guys and one guy in this line? So he went up to the guy and he said, hey, fella. I don't understand. We got all these guys here saying they were controlled by their wives on earth, but you're standing here under this sign that says, never controlled by my wife on earth. I'm a little confused. Why are you standing here? And the guy kind of looked around, and standing behind Peter was his wife, who'd been his wife on earth. And he said, well, Peter, my wife told me to stand here. <laughs> I'm not here to offend any of you women, Okay. Just kind of jumpstart the sermon this morning on how we have to deal with people who are controlling and manipulating. And so to help us do that, we're going to look at three biblical examples that the Bible shows very clearly how people were controlled and manipulated. The first is found in Genesis 25. It involves two brothers. It is how Jacob manipulated and controlled his twin brother Esau. And if you remember the story, they were twins. And when they were born, Esau was born first, which means he would be the firstborn son, which means he'd be entitled to everything his father had. But the Bible tells us that Jacob was holding on to the heel of Esau as if to try to pull him back into the wound and say, no, 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 I want to be the firstborn. And so as a result of that, his parents gave Jacob the name Jacob, which means heel grabber, uh, thief, <laughs> stealer, cheater. Isn't that a great name? They named Esau Esau because Esau stands for red and hairy. The Bible describes Esau as being very hairy and red hair. So you got one son that's named Esau and one named Jacob. So let's look at this in Genesis 25. Now Jacob knows he will be at the mercy of his older brother about how much wealth he will get when their father dies. Because all of it goes to the firstborn son, and then the firstborn decides how the rest of the brothers, if there are any, get anything. Beginning in verse 29, it says this. One day when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau arrived home from the wilderness exhausted and hungry. Esau said to Jacob, I'm starved. Give me some of that red stew. And this is how Esau got his other name, Edom, which means red. All right, Jacob replied, but trade me your rights as the firstborn son. Jacob, he wants that firstborn rights. Now look at the rest of it. Look, I'm dying of starvation, said Esau. What good is my birthright to me now? But Jacob said, first, you must swear that your birthright is mine. So Esau swore an oath, thereby selling all of his rights as the firstborn to his brother Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentil stew. Esau ate the meal and then got up and left. Right there we see how Jacob manipulated and controlled his twin brother for the right to inherit everything from their father. So now we're going to jump over to Mark 6. There's another example of I can't even say manipulation and control in the Bible. It involves some women in Herod. 
Some women manipulated and controlled King Herod. Look at this in Mark 6. It says this. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John the baptizer and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guest. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, for what should I ask? And she said, the head of John the baptizer. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and said, and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the baptizer on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When the disciples, when his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Now, John the baptizer, if you know, in the Bible is the forerunner to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And he'd been actually putting Herod down. Herod had decided he was more in love with his brother Philip's wife than his own wife. So he divorced his wife and convinced his brother to divorce his wife, and he married, really, his sister-in-law, his ex-sister-in-law. Okay? And John criticized him for doing that. So she was really the niece and the sister-in-law to Herod and to Philip. Now get this. So what John does is criticize him for adultery and incest. He decides to marry his niece. And so Herod did not like the criticism that John was bringing against him. So he had him thrown in prison. And as we read, he was convicted. And the Bible says he would gladly listen to John. But he also feared him. And the Bible says, if you could read Greek, you would see that he threw this huge banquet for his guests. All these men. Meaning it was a drunken fest. And at the height of this drunken fest... Herodias sent her daughter Salome in to dance. And in the Greek text, it is very clear what she did. It was a very provocative, sensual dance, meaning she did some lap dancing. And when it said she pleased Herod, the word used there in the Greek means to bring about sexual arousal or sensation. And this is why Herod is willing to give her anything she wants. He's drunk and he's aroused. He has no idea how he's being manipulated and controlled in the wrong way. So he asked her, name it and I'll give it to you up to half of my kingdom. And she names the price and to save face, he does it. So she was able, she and her mother were able to manipulate and control Herod. Here's a third example from the Bible. It involves a woman named Delilah who manipulated and controlled Samson. And you know the story, Delilah Delilah over and over and over in the Old Testament tried to convince Samson to tell her the source of his strength. And we get this in Judges chapter 16. Look what it says in verse 15. She said, how can you say I love you when you won't even trust me? Hear the manipulation? Three times now, you've toyed with me like a cat with a mouse, refusing to tell me the secret of your great strength. Now look at verse 16. She kept at it day after day, nagging and tormenting him. Finally, he was fed up. He couldn't take another minute of it. He spilled it. He told her, a razor has never touched my head. I've been God's Nazarite from the conception. 
If I were shaved and my strength would lead me, I would be as helpless as any other mortal. Samson really thinks his strength is in his hair. His strength was not in his hair. His strength came from God. The hair was just a visible symbol to him to remind him where his strength came from. And you know the rest of the story. She cuts his hair. He eventually dies. Now let me ask you, how many of you would say in your life you know you've been manipulated or controlled by somebody? Anybody? All right. That's all of us. I want to do a little experiment here. All right. Just do it with me. Lift up your left hand. Just hold it up. Good, good, good. All right, you can put it down. Now lift up your right foot barely off the floor. Okay? I'm just seeing if I can manipulate you and control you this morning, all right? Just seeing if you go along with it, all right? You see how easy it is? Sometimes you're being manipulated and controlled and you don't even know it. And sometimes you do. So I want us to look first at what are the two main weapons manipulators and controllers use. They have two in their arsenal. These are the two biggies. They may have more, but these are the two biggies. Here's the first one, threats. They will say to you, if you don't do what I ask, then I'm not going to cooperate with you any longer. If you don't do what I ask, I'm leaving you. If you don't, do, if you don't listen to me, I'm going to hang up on you. They use threats. If you don't pay me any more attention, I'm having nothing to do with you anymore in the future. So they'd like to use threats. That's their number one arsenal, their number one weapon. Here's the second one they use. Besides threats, they use guilt. Do you hear it with Delilah? If you really loved me, you would do what I'm asking or I thought we were close friends. But obviously we're not as close as I thought we were. You have misled me on this. Or if you don't meet my needs, I'll get my needs met somewhere else. Or after all I've done for you, you won't do this one little thing for me. Well, then there's spiritual manipulation and control. You know, if you really loved Jesus... If you really loved him like you claim, if you were a strong Christian like you claim, you'd be at church every Sunday helping out in every way that you could. And of course, there's the silent guilt. They just don't talk to you anymore. So they love to use threats. They love to use guilt. And all of us have probably been victims of that, and maybe some of us have even done that. So what I want us to do today is let's go to God's Word. Let's look how the Bible tells us to deal with manipulators and controllers. Because you're going to have to deal with them. You're going to have to face them. They're everywhere you go. They're at your work. They're in your neighborhood. They're in churches. They're at the supermarket. Wherever you go, you're going to have to face people who like to manipulate and control. So I've kind of built this off of the word call as an acrostic. So let's look how it means, how it plays out. First thing you need to do is communicate when a manipulator controller is trying to dominate you. You just call it out right there. Say what it is. I know what you're doing. You're trying to control me. You're trying to manipulate me. Now, sometimes I've met a lot of people, they don't mind being a doormat. They've just developed this relationship. They grew up in a family where they were dominated. And so they marry into a relationship. They begin a family. And all they do is they just become the doormat. And they're used to that. That's how they live. But that's not the best way to have relationships. And in Matthew chapter 16, we see where Peter tries to dominate, he tries to control, he tries to manipulate Jesus. And he gets a reaction from Jesus he was not expecting. Look at this beginning in verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began telling his followers that he must go to Jerusalem. He explained that the Jewish elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of the law would make him suffer many things. And he told them that he must be killed. Then on the third day, he would be raised from the dead. Now look at this. Peter took Jesus aside and began to criticize him. God save you from those things, Lord. Those things will never happen to you. 
And here's what manipulators and controllers like to do. Peter is smart. He pulls Jesus off to the side. Why? He has more influence alone. It's just one-on-one. He knows exactly what he's doing, and he doesn't want this to happen, so he decides to pull Jesus off to the side. Now, to me, this is kind of sad and funny. Think about this. Here's Peter pulling God off to the side, saying, you ain't going to do this. It is over my dead body before this ever happens. No way, Jose. See, he doesn't realize who he's talking to. He's not just talking to Jesus. He's talking to God in the flesh named Jesus. And manipulators and controllers, when they're trying to do that, you need to call them out. It says he began to criticize. The Greek words that's translated there as began is the Greek word archon. And it means to rule, to govern, to a preeminent position of status. So Peter thinks, well, you know, I'm the head disciple. Here, I need to. Jesus, come here. I'm over all these guys. I know that because you said I'm the rock. So come here. We need to have a little come to Jesus meeting. So he uses his status as the head disciple to try to set Jesus straight. Then there's the word rebuke. It means to threaten through authoritative command. In other words, Peter doesn't just ask Jesus. He commands Jesus. You will not let this happen. No way. So he tries to manipulate and he tries to control Jesus. And people who are manipulative and controlling, they will try to do that to you too. They may not like what you're doing. They may not like where you're going. And so they will interject a statement or pull you off to the side and say, we need to talk about this. You know, we're good friends. At least I thought we were. I need you to listen to me on this. I've known you a long time. And so they try to manipulate you. They try to control you. And many times they do it in very unhealthy ways. I don't doubt Peter's love for Jesus. He doesn't want to hurt Jesus. It's not that he hates Jesus. And many times your manipulators and controllers, they love you. It's not that they're trying to hurt you. They really think they're trying to help you. Peter thought he was helping Jesus. He thought for whatever reason, Jesus has totally messed up here. And so the first thing we have to do is call them out when they do it. The problem is many people simply don't do that because they're so used to being controlled and manipulated by the people around them. So how can you do this? How do you know that you're being manipulated and controlled? Let me give you several ways you can know this. First, you can't say no to that person. When they ask you to do something, when they try to manipulate you or control you to do something, you, you, you can't say no to them. You may be thinking, I don't have time to do this. This isn't the right thing for me to do right now. But you can't say no. Second thing is you always feel guilty around them. You see, that's one of their weapons. They will load you up with guilt. If if you really love Jesus, like you said, you would do this. If you really loved Southside, like you said, you would do this. So they throw in the guilt. Or maybe you grew up in a household where your parents did that. Or maybe you're in a family now where someone in the family uses those kind of threats against you. And, or maybe it could be in a family situation where one of your parents died and they've remarried. And you feel guilty if you are not just as in love with that step parent as you were with your biological parent. I've had people through my life in ministry tell me, my father or my mother jumps all over me because I just don't run up and hug them and kiss them like they were my biological parent. They make me feel guilty. And I want you to hear, it's not that they're trying to hurt you. It's not that they don't love you. They do love you. But they see your response. Here's the third thing. You ultimately feel responsible. If things start falling apart, you're going to blame yourself for it. That's a sign you've been manipulated, you've been controlled. And number four, you compromise your values to please them. It's when you're in a dating relationship and one of the, you dating says, well, you know, if you really love me, you give in to sex. And you say, well, you know, the Bible says we're not to engage in premarital sex. We're not to have sex at all until we're married. But if you love me, you would. And you say, but you don't understand. 
I, I, I took an oath to stay a virgin until I'm married. But if you love me, if you don't do this, I'm walking out. And so now you're going to feel responsible for the breakup. And so they love to use threats. They love to use guilt. They love to put you in a position to where you feel you're responsible if something goes wrong. And that's how you know you're being manipulated. It's how you're being controlled. Here's the second call out. Here's what the A stands for. Say to the controller manipulator, your attempt to control and manipulate me is not going to affect me. Jesus does this with Peter. You just say, hey, I know what you're doing here. I know where this is headed, but you have no power over me. This is not going to affect me in any way. This is not going to work on me. It worked in the past, but it's not going to work now. I see it for what it is. I have submitted my heart to Jesus Christ, and I answer to him. I'm not going to do this because I don't think it's the thing I should do. Now, let's go back to the story with Peter and Jesus. Look at verse 23. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me who? Who? Have you ever had somebody in the heat of the moment call you, you devil? I mean, Jesus didn't mince words there. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, and you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Jesus called it out. He called Peter out. Now, Peter, thinking, you know, if he said, he's probably looking, where's the devil? Jesus called him out on it. He named it for what it was. Jesus said, no, you're not going to do this to me. This is not going to affect me. And he called it what it was. He realized what it was. It was the devil trying to get him to compromise. And people will do that to you. I read about a small boy who was writing a, a letter to God when Christmas over his things he wanted for Christmas. Okay. And he started out his letter this way. You know, God, I, I've been good for six months now. And then he began to scratch that out. No, I've been good for three months now. And he scratched that out. He said, I've been good for two weeks now. And he began to scratch that out. And he said, he got an idea. On the kitchen table was a full nativity set. Mary, Joseph, little baby Jesus, sheep, cows, the wise men, the shepherds. And he went over and he picked up Mary and he brought it back to the table where he was sitting. He set this down and he went back to writing. He says, now, I've only been good for two weeks, Jesus. But God, if you ever want to see your mother again. <laughs> that's how they work. They know what buttons to push. They know how to push them. Remember weeks ago, we talked about emotional Buttons that people can push in you to get you to do what they want you to do. This little kid thought he could play that game with God. Okay? And here's what I want you to know. It's your next fill-in. If someone else has control over you, you are committing the sin of idolatry. It's idolatry. Exodus 23 says, you shall have no other gods or idols before me. When you allow someone else to have control over you or manipulate you, you have surrendered God in your place for them. And the Bible calls that idolatry. You can never become all that God wants you to be if you become a people pleaser. Some of you are people pleasers. You don't want to rock the boat. You'll just go along with the flow. But then you'll get home and you're like Muttley in your house walking around. Such a frightening, hitting Martin. But you'll never say it publicly because you want to be a people pleaser. You want everybody to like you, everybody to love you. Nobody to have any problems with you. So you just go along with the flow, but it creates anger in you. In the fall of 2022, the fishing world was rocked by one of the biggest cheating scandals ever. It's called the Erie Wally Trail Tournament. Jason Fisher, the director of the tournament, became suspicious when the five fish he estimated to be about four pounds each weighed in at over 20 pounds. In fact, as he weighed them, the weight kept increasing. 
He went up to 34 pounds. And he's holding the fish. He's a professional fisherman. He's going, something's not right here. These fish should not be weighing this much. So he turned around to the fisherman, the guys who caught it. He said, did you catch these fish? Yes, we did. He said, I, 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 I'm shocked. I've never seen fish weigh this much, especially the smallest size of fish. He said, well, something's not right here. And he began to feel on the fish. And they just didn't feel right either. So he took a knife and cut them open. He said, it feels like they've been eating rocks or something. And what he found in each fish was huge weights weighing down the weight, increasing the weight of those fish. He hollered out at the tournament, we got weights in fish. He turned around, looked at the two men who had submitted these fish and said, get out of here. You're not in this tournament. They were vying for a $30,000 prize for each fish that was the biggest fish. And they had submitted four of them. They thought they could manipulate and control the outcome by cheating. People will resort to all kinds of extremes to manipulate you and control you when they feel their way is not working. Some of you just let people manipulate you. You just let them control you. Some of you do it because the people who are doing it are kind of bullies. They're very vocal. They're very demanding. You hear them, you know them. You can't escape them. And then when you allow this to happen, when you succumb to them, you become their agents of idolatry. So you've got to make a choice. You need to say, I'm not dancing this dance with you. I want to do what God wants me to do, and I'm calling this out. You're trying to manipulate you. You're trying to control me. You're trying to turn me into an idolater. That's not going to happen. Jesus called out Peter. He called it for what it was. Here's a third biblical principle to help you with how to deal with a manipulator and controller. Lay out new terms for the relationships. That's exactly what Jesus did with Peter. He laid out new terms. And the person who's trying to control you, trying to manipulate you, Jesus turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You're not going to control me. Jesus did not allow Peter face to face to have that kind of control and manipulation over him, and he called it for what it was. So he laid out new terms for Peter, so much so that the three questions Jesus asked Peter, it grieved Peter. Three times in the Gospel of John, Jesus said this to Peter. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, then take care of my sheep. Jesus changed the nature of the relationship, okay? I'm the Lord, you're not. And at first, Peter wanted to be in control of Jesus. And by the time Jesus has asked him this three times, Peter is grieved. Now, why does he do that? Because Peter, before, if you remember, before the resurrection, had denied Jesus three times. Jesus told him, you will deny ever knowing me. I'll never do that. Cross my heart, hope to die. Second, I will never do that. I will never, never. I will die for you. And I believe in that moment, Peter meant it. Some of you have made statements like that. I will always read my Bible every day. I will pray every day. I'll be at church every time I can. And you don't do it. I believe you meant it when you said it. I believe Peter was sincere. I believe Peter felt he would do that. But when he was put to the pressure, he caved in. So for the three denials, Jesus said, look, we're changing the nature of this relationship. I'm leaving. you got to stay, so feed my sheep. You cannot be all God wants you to be if you're under the thumb of a manipulator and a controller. I read this story, true story about a married couple named Jeff and Susie. When they got married, Jeff came home from work one day and he walked in the kitchen and Susie was preparing dinner. And he noticed he, she had this huge ham. And all of a sudden she took this big knife, cut off this end of it, and then cut off the other end of it. And then she took the ham and she put it in the baking pan, stuck it in the oven. He was a little curious. Why did you waste the ham? He said, I don't understand. Why did you cut off the ends of the ham? She said, well, I really don't know. That's how my mother did it. 
So a few weeks later, they were over at her mother's house, and Jeff brought it up. He said, Mom, I don't understand. Susie was cooking the other day some ham, and she cut off both the ends of the ham. And I asked her why she did it. She said she really didn't know. She said she did it because you did it. Why do you cut off the ends of the ham? She goes, I don't know. That's the way my mother did it. Well, fortunately, grandmother was still alive. So a few weeks later, they had grandmother over for dinner. Everybody was there, and Jeff couldn't wait. He wanted to know. So he looked at Susie's grandmother and says, look, Grandma, I don't understand. Susie was cooking this ham. She cut off both ends. I asked her why she did it. She said, I don't know. That's the way my mother did it. And so I then I asked her daughter, Susie's mom, why she did it. She said, she didn't know. That's why you did it. So why do you cut off both ends of the ham? And grandmother just looked at him and she said, oh, that's easy to answer. She said, there seems to be a huge misunderstanding here about me. Just let me set the record straight here. Okay. The baking pan I had was too small to fit the whole ham, so I just cut off the ends to put the ham in it. Now, I have a point. Here's the point. If you don't deal with a controller and manipulator, you will resort back to a dysfunctional relationship. You need to deal with them. You need to set the terms of the relationship. You need to lay it out. You need to tell them, I love you. I want to be friends. I want to be part of your life. But this ends now. This is not going to continue. You're not going to control me and manipulate me like this ever again. You cut it off. Here's the fourth point. Strive to live for an audience of one. You live for an audience of one. If you're driven by people, you're living for people. You're not living for the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you let people control you, that's idolatry. But if you serve the one true God... And him alone, that's called worship. Look at Galatians 1.10. Paul says this. Obviously, I'm not trying to be a people pleaser. No, I'm trying to please God. If I were still trying to please people, I would not be Christ's servant. So Paul says, I'm not going to let people dictate how I am. I answer to Jesus Christ and to him alone. He says, you're not going to control me. You're not going to manipulate me. You see, when it comes to manipulators and controllers, Here's why they are primarily driven to manipulate and control. Manipulators and controllers are driven by fear. They're driven by fear. And what is that fear? Things are not going to go the way they want. So they rise up, they get angry, they shout, they scream, they holler, they pressure, they throw on guilt. They do all these threats against you to try to get you to do what they want out of fear. Proverbs 29, 25 says, A person's fear sets a trap for him. We live in a strange world. It changes every day. We can't put our faith in our government. We can't put our faith in politicians. We can't even put our faith in the money we have in the bank or financial institutions. We can't put our faith in any education system where our faith needs to be only is in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where it needs to be. If not, you will be driven by fear. You'll be afraid to do anything out of fear. Well, if I spend this now, ooh, what if I don't have money later? If I do this, what if this? Fear will drive you. It will possess you. It will control you. And you will go nuts with it. But if you don't want to be called a manipulator or controller, if you want to be a, a disciple of Jesus Christ, disciples are driven by faith. We're driven by faith. The Bible says this in Hebrews 11, 1 and 6. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. It is impossible to please God without faith. There's only one way you can please God. is through faith. Not fear. And if you're going to put your faith in the wrong place, you will be overwhelmed by fear. So you need to give up that fear, hand it over to God, trust God with it and say, God, I don't know where this is going to go. But this is where you're leading. I'm going to trust you no matter what. In his book, Fearless, Max Licato writes about the power of fear and how it can possess us to really turn us into beastly people. He says, fear turns us into control freaks. For fear at its center is a perception of something out of control or being lost. 
When life spins wildly, we grab for a component of life we can manage. Our diet, the tidiness of our home, the armrests of a plane, or many, in most cases, people. The more insecure we feel, the meaner we become. We growl and bear our fangs. Why? Is it because we're bad? No. In part, because we feel cornered by a loss of not having control. He said Martin Niemöller documents an extreme example of this. He was a German pastor who took a heroic stand against Adolf Hitler. And when he first met the dictator in 1933, Niemöller stood at the back of the room and listened. When he was asked by his wife later what he learned, he said this one statement. I have discovered that Herr Hitler is a terribly frightened man. And he is going to lead us into war and kill millions because of that fear. Fear will release the tyrant in you. You will grasp for anything you can to try to control and manipulate everyone around you. And in the process, you alienate yourself from the very people you claim you love. Peter tried to do it with Jesus, and Jesus called him out on it. Southside, I've given you ways to deal with manipulation and control. It is my prayer you will do it. Let's pray.